Good evening. I am so pleased to accept your invitation to deliver this inaugural lecture. I want to acknowledge the Wurundjeri traditional owners of this beautiful land. I bring greetings from Cape York Peninsula. This is an appropriate university for this discussion tonight because the circumstances surrounding the Federation are going to be the subject of my remarks here tonight. There are kind of several areas of crucial importance lying between the Indigenous and non-Indigenous people of Australia that we were always obliged to address. And we've addressed some of them already. Or well, we're in the process of addressing some of them at the moment. But some of them remain outstanding. So firstly, the question of citizenship. We dealt with that in the 1967 referendum and the original exclusion of Aboriginal people from the law making power of the federal parliament and the exclusion of indigenous people from being counted in the census was addressed in the 1967 referendum. The right to vote had been addressed in legislation prior to that, but by and large on the question of our citizenship in the country We've gone about trying to address it in Australia and we've made a general good of it. I will make some remarks about the shortcomings of the 67 referendum and the means by which we joined the nation. But I want to make the remark that on questions of citizenship and equality, the 67 referendum went a long way towards filling the lacuna. The second issue is land rights. And of course, grievance between indigenous and non-indigenous people always settle, settle on land. Land is the fundamental grievance. And we've made a fist of it. It's not as if the issue has not been confronted. We have in the various jurisdictions of Australia legislation dealing with land rights and through the history of the country various measures were taken by governments and parliaments to recognise the land rights of Indigenous peoples, albeit in inadequate ways. The crucial progress with land rights was, of course, legislation in the Northern Territory enacted by the Commonwealth Parliament that has seen more than half of the Territory restored to its traditional owners. But the fundamental change was the High Court's decision in Mabo, which said to Australians that the law of Australia properly comprehended, recognised Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people as the native owners of their traditional homelands. The land rights of the Indigenous people, the High Court said, arose from their traditional laws and customs and their long occupation of Australia. It was not the consequence of a grant from the Crown or a legislative enactment of the Commonwealth or the States. Mabo was crucial. It was a fundamental step forward and discarding terra nullius 
as the assumption of the law in Australia was absolutely decisive. The jurisprudence of native title over the past 30 years is imperfect. But in my home region, in three years' time, we will settle the last native title claims to the land. The third issue concerns empowerment and self-determination. We have not made good ground on that. Our people's afflictions and troubles derive from disempowerment. We had an important report from the Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody more than 30 years ago. And Commissioner Johnson, who wrote that report, said at the end of all of the recommendations and all of the analysis of the parlous problems and tragedies, he said at the end of the day, the solution lay in the empowerment of Aboriginal people. There was no other way of getting on top of the problems except through empowerment. But what does that mean? What did it mean that governments and indigenous communities needed to do to empower our people? There were no answers in the Royal Commission's report. Empowerment remained elusive. How do you empower a people stricken by poverty and social problems and excluded from the economy and incarcerated in the various institutions at the most egregious rates? Empowerment, in my view, was the crucial answer, but what it meant in practice was never articulated and still has not been. The question facing Australia, particularly in the wake of what I believe will be a successful vote in the voice referendum in October this year, the fundamental question we will have to answer in the design of legislation following a successful vote is how do we set up the conditions for the empowerment of a disempowered people? The Uluru Statement from the Heart talks about the torment of our powerlessness. So I want to say some words about what it is that I think we need to do on the front of empowerment, to empower us socially, to empower us culturally, to empower us economically and politically, so that we are fully functioning and fully powerful citizens of Australia contributing all of our talents and potential and seizing all of our opportunities. We have to answer this question in relation to other disempowered peoples. We share parlous circumstances with too many migrant and poor white communities who are excluded from opportunity and privilege in this country. Empowerment is a universal need for all disempowered communities. And we need to find the magic. We need to find the solution for how it is that a wealthy country such as ours can give to all citizens 
a rightful place in the economy, in the society. The fourth issue is recognition. What does it mean that there are an indigenous people in this country? What does it mean that it is said that they were here for 65,000 years. What does it mean for Australia that that might be a fact? Recognition. We've got to grapple with it. Australia is not a country 250 years old. It cannot be the case that all that is important to Australia is what has happened since 1770 or 1788. But how do we come to terms with it? What recognition do we afford to it and in what form? because all of that was here prior to the coming of Europeans was a, a huge cultural heritage and languages and custodianship of country. All of this superabundance accumulated over millennia how do we come to terms with it in the modern idea of Australia? It is this recognition that we're trying to come to grips with in this referendum. Australians have been reluctant to grapple with this question in particular. We've been reluctant over two centuries to deal with the question. Every time it came to our notice and every time we had a public discussion about it, we were prone to denial. We were prone to putting the question on. We were prone to simply declaring, well, that doesn't matter, we own the joint now. And those questions are not important. I've said in my Boyer lectures that I came to an understanding of race in this country and racism towards the original people. My thinking after watching that documentary about the footballer Adam Goods was that yes, there is the original sin racism. It still survives in Australia. The racism that views indigenous people as the lowest of the low, as subhuman, as somehow deficient and not really human. The assumption that we are members of another race, that's an element of Australian racism today, but it is now a marginal one in my view. It has greatly receded. I still no, I can remember as a boy that racism in rural Cape York. I know the assumptions that the wider population had about our people. And I saw the way my people were treated in the streets. But Australia's changed. The original sin racism has much receded. 
And I came to realize watching the Goods film that there were actually two other dynamics at play. And I'll deal with the third first. And that is the dynamic of whitefellas fighting whitefellas over blackfellas. A lot of the ruction is actually between the whitefellas about their attitudes towards us and their behaviour towards us. Uh, that is a, a real part of the discussion about race in the country. Progressives versus conservatives largely over the treatment of indigenous people and attitudes towards them. But it's this remaining issue that I think is the important one. The remaining issue that underpins poor attitudes towards First Peoples is that the country is still uncertain about how to deal with the ongoing existence of Indigenous people. How do we come to terms with the place of indigenous people in the nation? And it's always been the case that whenever this discussion came up, the question was, gee, if we recognize the indigenous, we're delegitimizing ourselves. If we recognise the place of the original peoples, we're like, where do we fit in then? And that is, of course, an existential fear. How can we be Australians and claim a rightful place in this country we've created when we recognise the indigenous? Every time this question came up during the colonial period, the answer was, well, we can't. We are not going to recognise the indigenous and, uh, and write ourselves out of the picture. The settler insistence that this is their country and that is all there is to it has been the story for more than two and a half centuries. But is there another way? Was there a better way to think about Australia? Is there a better way to think about Australia? A way of mutual recognition. A way that properly accommodates the descendants of the so-called settlers and the original peoples. That is what we're coming to grips with, with this referendum. We're coming to grips with the idea of mutual recognition. And the Constitution is the rightful place to enact that understanding. Importantly, that accommodation, that, dare I say it, that reconciliation is one that requires us to put denial behind us. We can't cling to the old denial. We have to face up to the pre-existence of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who undertook a heroic passage across 
the Torres land bridge to occupy this land more than 60,000 years ago. Australia's history begins 65,000 years ago. It did not, as one former prime minister put it, start with the first fleet in 1788. The second idea we must abandon if we're going to have a reconciliation is the idea of separatism. We are carving out a rightful but not separate place in the nation. And we do that through enactment in the Constitution. We want a place in the nation. I completely understand the sense of alienation and skepticism and cynicism about whether this country will properly accommodate us and respect us. I completely understand that, but I can never agree with a strategy that's premised on separatism. The voice is an agenda of inclusion. The voice is an agenda for reconciliation. It's an agenda for mutual recognition. It's crucial that we succeed. It's absolutely crucial for indigenous people but more so for the country as a whole for us to get this right and achieve mutual recognition in the referendum in October. We will see who we properly are as Australians when we do this. We will see clearly for the first time the answer to the question, who are the Australians? And what is Australia? In my view, if we look plainly into the mirror, as a collective, we see three stories. We see the ancient story of 65,000 years of indigenous heritage. That's the foundations of the country. That's the truth. Let's not deny it. The second part of Australia is the British institutions erected on those foundations. That cannot be denied either. They endure for the benefit of all Australians. We have adapted them to our conditions and our circumstances and they mostly serve us well. When we look into the mirror, we see those institutions we've inherited and we've transplanted from Britain to this country. The third part of Australia, which by the way counts the indigenes and the Britons, is our multicultural unity. That's the third part of our story. We've achieved an extraordinary multicultural unity in the country. We have diversity in unity. Australia is not, is no longer a settler society. 
We may have imagined that that was our origins and we may have had that idea for two centuries, but in the future, that has to be history. The new Australia is an Australia with three stories. The indigenous heritage that we denied for two centuries, the British institutions, and fundamentally, the multicultural unity. I want an Australia where the Somalian Australian child is understood by everyone as an Australian child. I want the Chinese Australian youth of the future to be understood as Australian Chinese youth and that none of us harbour any equivocation about that. All of our cultures are Australian and we have a rightful place all in this country. I think a successful referendum in October will enable us to move past the idea of settler Australia. It will be a new Australia. And when we recognise the Indigenous people and we have mutual recognition and respect and we understand the three stories of Australia, racism will recede. Because that second basis for, for ruction and turmoil and trouble will have gone. The idea that the migrants had no legitimate place in the country if we recognised Indigenous people that idea will fall away. It will be seen for the silliness that it is. We gotta get organized and we have to win in October. This will be the most important question the country answers, perhaps other than the Federation question itself in 1901. This is not a federal election. If you want to vote, vote for your political tribe, you do that in two years' time. If you want to get rid of Labor, do it in two years' time. If you want to reject Peter Dutton, do that in two years' time. I don't care relative to the question at hand here, those are mundane questions. They're things we do as a matter of course every three years. The question at the referendum goes to the heart of what it is to be an Australian. There's a fundamental question about our self-image and our identity at stake here. This referendum is much more important than a federal election and we should not confuse the two. Liberal voters need to understand that now is the time to stand up for Australia, not for the Liberal Party. Labor voters and Green voters should understand the same. And National Party voters should understand the same. They will have the perfect opportunity to make their political choices when the federal election next comes around. They need to understand that this referendum vote in October is an entirely different question.
and, and they must summon up inside themselves an answer to a greater question. Let me put the view that the question is moral. It's not at its heart a political question. It is a moral question for the country. And all Australians must understand that whether yes or no, the choice is sacred. One will lead us to a new future. The other will lead us into an abyss. We are the generation charged with the responsibility to make that choice. As much as we may want to disoblige ourselves from making the choice, history falls on us. The time comes on our watch. It falls to us to make the decision. And it's a decision that is not just a question for our own individual predilection or jaundice. It's a question for our children. Because a constitutional change, by definition, is not just a question for my lifetime or yours. The constitutional questions in 1901 have long outlasted those who voted for it. The questions answered in 1901 bequeathed to the children of Australia over many generations have long out outlasted the people who voted yes. There were three referenda. The first one in 1898, Queensland, even though it had been led by Samuel Griffiths as the leading advocate for the new compact, nevertheless, Queensland stood aloof from the first vote. Only four states participated in the 1898 referendum. New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia, and Tasmania. So they ran another referendum two years later, which included Queensland. People constantly ask me about the troubling polls. Well, the troubling polls leading to the creation of Australia um, were just as uncertain. If there were polls in that time, we'd be asking the same questions of Samuel Griffiths and Henry Parks and Edmund Barton. There were naysayers back in the 1890s leading to the 1901 referendum that created Australia, the Commonwealth of Australia. And yet, who in the wake of that decision who voted no would not have reflected that a great thing had been achieved. We have to take ownership of our time in history. 
Let me say, that ownership needs to be assumed by the non-Indigenous people of Australia. It can't fall upon us. We can only tell you that this is an important thing to do. We can only tell you that we have promised our people that investing in this will yield a good result. They will honour our invitation. We should put our eggs in that basket. We should believe in the Australian people. We should have faith, notwithstanding all of the reasons for us to doubt. But it can't fall on us. We're only 3% of the population. We can't turn a result in any jurisdiction. It requires 97% of the country to make its decision. We can only urge you to make the right decision. But the making of that decision falls upon you and the consequences of it fall upon your children. Do we want to bequeath to future generations a reconciled country that has put some of these unresolved issues behind us for the benefit of our people? We needed leadership. At certain junctures of a history of a people, they need leadership. We need leadership to show us who we are. And we need leadership to show us the path to achieve a more perfect Commonwealth. That is why I so strongly applaud the Prime Minister Albanese for his commitment here. It is not that I carry some kind of brief for the Labour Party or a Labour government. I would have just as much wished that a Conservative government had taken this recognition forward. But we hesitated. We wasted time. The years ticked by. It's year 15 now. No public policy issue has ever run this long or consumed as much time and report writing and inquiry as this one. And the idea of the voice is so modest and yet so profound I'm very grateful to the Prime Minister for the decision he took to prioritise constitutional recognition and to honour the Uluru Statement from the heart. Of course there's practical arguments in favour of it. How can a people in such a parlous condition continue on as we have. In Queensland, we will soon have more than 50% of the children in out-of-home care coming from Indigenous communities, from Indigenous families, from Indigenous mothers and fathers. 4% of the population contributing to more than 50% of the children in out-of-home care. A prison population which in 
per population terms is worse than the United States with African Americans. And I think we've subsided into some kind of assumption that that is all a kind of, those just outrageous numbers are somehow, you know, it's got to be explained by the, you know, unique shortcomings of indigenous people, morally, socially. They may not love their children as much. They may be more inclined to, cr inclined to criminality than other Australians. I think those are the justifications that we harbour in explanation of the tragedy. But if I pressed you on it, I don't think any reasonable Australia, Australian would, would hold on to those assumptions. It means we have to address the structural circumstances that have resulted in more people being in jail in Cape York today than in the 1970s. Nobody in my home community was in jail when I was a child. So I urge in closing that the non-Indigenous people of Australia, migrants and Europeans and Britons, take responsibility for our constitution. Voting no, in my view, would be a very bad option for Australia. The cost to the country is incalculable, incalculable. We will pay a cost that I don't even want to think about. Let me say in closing, something that is only my, my political view. It is not the view of the collective leadership around Australia or other indigenous people. My own personal view as someone who tries to think about where are we headed and how might we get there. And that is that a no vote will eviscerate reconciliation. Because those two words there are crucial to reconciliation, truth and justice. Otherwise, we're just playing some kind of a kabuki game or something. We, we, could, we, we use the R word, but it will mean nothing. This is what is at stake. We have a chance for reconciliation. It's our best chance. We have to seize it. We can win this campaign if we see this as a moral question, important for our children. A raid against us will be the bots with their algorithms. A raid against us will be the trolls and are the trolls. But we can beat the trolls. We can beat the bots. This is not about algorithms. This is about the soul of the country. And when we appeal to the souls of our fellow citizens, we will win. Thank you.